Uh, excellent stuff. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, and good morning to everyone. Uh, special thanks also from Busker Browns and also from the House Hotels Bar. They, they made their quota for the year last night. Um, most of us were there until insanely late hours, so it was good. Um, before I get going here, I just wanted to make a couple of quick thank yous. Uh, first to, to Pat Dolan and to, there's John Cannon back there, up in, up in the cheap seats, how are you? Good. Um, two absolutely, in my mind, legendary people and they're just amazing human beings that it's, it's an honor to work with and uh, just some of the coolest, most accomplished people that are, that are out there. Um, also, thanks to the staff at the Child and Family Research Center. Um, as Sean mentioned, I spend enough time here that my wife's convinced that I have another family here. Um, <laughs> The fact of the matter is I actually do, and it's the people in the center. They, they look after me more than, than anyone I know, and uh, they're doing truly amazing work that's, that's changing the human condition, so just great stuff. Um, and then I guess just a quick last thank you, too, to my fellow presenters uh, yesterday and today. An absolutely amazing group, and uh, uh, I'm absolutely honored and humbled just to be called, you know, counted among you, so it's just great stuff. Um, what I thought I would do here, I, I kind of want to talk about the role of citizenship and how this cuts across, really cuts across generational levels where you've got young people and old people and um, people in between and, and how we, we pull this together to make effective functioning societies. And I promise, you know, I am an academic, but I try to get my hands dirty and be in the field more than I'm in the classroom and everywhere else. Um, so there'll be a bit of theory and other things here, but uh, I promise I'm just using it to set up things that we can actually use in practice, some of the things that, that we know that work and uh, are good in lots of ways. So. Let me just start off with, with a couple things here in terms of, you know, really a reason here. Why would we bother promoting citizenship? Um, and there's a couple real effective reasons here. As we go through, you know, some of this may sound kind of touchy-feely and warm and fuzzy and everything else. Um, for those of you that know me, I'm not that kind. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a hippie. Um, I'm, no offense to the hippies, I'm an offspring of it. <laughs> I'm an offspring of hippies, but uh, you know, I think there's, there's some real tangible things here that we can put into practice. There's things that are, that are measurable, that are real, that are important. So I, I, I want to stress on some of these. Um, you know, first of all, this idea of citizenship, one of the reasons to promote it. Um, it really is the cornerstone of any kind of effective society. It does tremendous things for personal development, social and psychological development of people, but also of the wider places that, that we hold dear. Um, it leads really to the basis of any kind of civil society uh, and deals with a lot of the problems and issues that we are always kind of facing. Um, it shapes the, the individual to a great extent. And we'll talk about this in a bit, but think about your own communities where you grew up. Uh, there was, there's tremendous things of that social structure that, that shaped who you are and put you on the path that, that you're in. Um, but it's also the case that it makes families and communities more resilient. If people are more active in their communities, uh, it leads to a whole host of things that, that Pat has studied and, and John and a whole bunch of other people here. Um, but those great things there, particularly when, when we talk about young people. They often get lost in the shuffle of, of citizenship. Uh, we invite them to, to be in, to take on a role in their communities, but then we make sure they come and sit in the corner and just be quiet and look busy and do nothing. Uh, the more we can engage them, the more we can make them really strong partners within this, uh, it leads to a whole host of outcomes for them that makes them much better for the whole process. Um, it's also the case that you know, the earlier we get young people involved in active citizenship, whether it's civic engagement or volunteerism or all other things, um, they start building a lot of the skills very early on uh, that helps them be productive citizens, that protects them from you know, you know, bad behaviors and all kinds of other stuff. And it makes them more resilient, more um, you know, better prepared to deal with diversity or adversity um, and all sorts of other things. And the last thing, too, the earlier we can get young people involved in this kind of citizenship, it really makes them activists. It takes them away from just being contributors to local society to actually being fighters for social justice uh, and protecting their rights and the rights of their fellow citizens. So it's really a very important thing there. Uh, and in my mind, this whole idea of community and citizenship, I think it's one of the central most important things we can focus on and go after. So first, let me just talk about a couple things here. Why should we even think about community? And there's a few reasons that are, that are essential here. Um, first of all, when you think about our communities, this is your immediate physical world. That's a pretty important thing. It's the places you hold dear. It's the places where you, had, you learned all of your life, life lessons, where you had all kinds of experiences. 
Um, it's also the case, it's the place where we learned all of our socialization. Now, as we think about maybe our communities being a little, you know, degraded or damaged or broken or all kinds of things they are, um, all these things you learned early on were really important. It's the place where you learned all the rules. It's where you learned how to interact with other people and be a functioning human being. Um, so it's very important there. The other thing, um, remember back, and it's getting harder for me to do, but remember back when your parents kicked you out of the house for the first time when you were like four years old, five years old, and said, go off to school. <laughs> That was a pretty important time in your life. You, you actually got immersed in the, into the community and you started shaping it from that moment on. And it started shaping you back. And there's this wonderful synergistic relationship that goes on. Um, so as, as our world changes, as things get different and we, we behave differently and interact differently, uh, this connection to community can kind of get lost or misplaced or other things. Uh, but it's been an important part of all the things we do. Um, now a few other things here. I'm gonna try and get through all this this theory background stuff very quick because I know we don't want to be dozing off this early. Um, other things it does, it contributes to an awful lot of well-being and we've got mountains of research to show this. The people that are more engaged in their community, there's a whole bunch of outcomes that come out of it. Young people develop better, um, people in general, if you talk to the, the physical science people, they actually tend to live longer, they have less stress. There's a whole bunch of reasons why community is a very important thing. Um, one of the key things it does that I always stress is the idea that it establishes channels of communication and patterns of interaction. When you think about it, our, our, our lives have changed. We've gotten much more, you know, um, much more busy, much more spread out. We don't interact the same way we used to. Um, you used to see people at community functions. You'd see them at pubs. You'd see them at church. You'd see them at all these different kind of things. Uh, as we get away from a lot of those things, we don't interact in the same ways that we used to. <clears throat> and with that come some problems. Um, one of the things I often tell my, my, my graduate and undergraduate students, if you want to think about community, just think about it as one big relationship. Now, raise your hands. So how many of you have been in relationships? You know. <laughs> uh, all right, good for you, good, good, good. <clears throat> Those that didn't raise your hand, there's still hope. Um, but if you think about it, you know, you've gone and you've, you've met your spouse, or you've met Mr. or Mrs. Wright, or Mr. or Mrs. Wright now, or whoever, and, Think about the way the process went on, I mean, especially when you first met them. You, know, you called 20 times a day, and you, you hung out constantly, and you did all this sorts of stuff. As time went on, yeah, you don't talk so much. You don't call constantly, you know. And think about what happened in that process. Little tiny you know, issues, you made mountains out of molehills, you had all these little kind of things that, that festered and, and made the problems. It is the exact same process exact same process as it is between two individuals and a community. Just more people, it's a little more messy and complicated, but it's the process there. And as we stop communicating and interacting, especially with young people, if they're cut off from different parts of the community, um, the community starts falling apart, and all the different things we have uh, start shattering there. So it's, it's an important thing to keep in mind as we do that. Um, on a much more practical note, if we have strong communities, we can organize the local resources we have right now to make a difference. If we were to go around this room, and if we were to take all the young people we know uh, and figure out what we have, who we know, what kind of connections we have, what kind of access we have to resources, we can facilitate an awful lot of social change right now, right at this moment. Um, you know, certainly we can apply for grants from foundations and from groups in Dublin and Washington and everywhere else. But the fact of the matter is we probably have to wait six months for those to come in, eight months, even if we do get them. We can do an awful lot of things right now. So this adaptive capacity at the local level is really important. And if we want that to be sustainable, which is absolutely essential these days, getting young people involved from the very beginning is, is the cornerstone of that. Um, and then one other piece here too, that it really provides a sense of belonging. And most of us, for as, as tough as we think we are, um, the places where we come from pro provide a, a tremendous amount of who we are. Uh, they shape our ideas. And if we feel disconnected from those places, uh, there's an awful lot of literature out there that shows that it, it starts leading to all kinds of unhealthy behaviors and all sorts of other stuff. So there's, there's great important connections here. Um, now just one last, last, last thing on this idea of community. Um, we're all familiar with the, you know, the global crisis we're, we're, we're in or coming out of or whatever it is um, with failing economies at the no local level, national level and everything else. Building strong communities, it helps us come up with self-help strategies. At the local level we can figure out, we know our own needs, we know our own problems, we know the reasons why all of these different things have taken place. 
um, much better than some you know, bureaucrat that has never been to the place we're from, um, making decisions in an office or a boardroom or wherever else. Uh, so we've got this capacity here to figure out what resources we have to make a difference, uh, to be involved in local decision making and all these kind of things. More often than not, that gets focused toward the adults. And that, that's fine. But very often, we don't include young people. And it's a terrible thing to have young people all of a sudden get thrown into this when they turn 18 or wherever else. If we want these actions to be effective and, and work in the long term, we've got to get them involved from the very beginning. So that's, that's a lot of kind of what I would like to talk about. Um, one of the things I thought maybe I could kind of just start with here and just, just uh, would give a little bit of an insight into why I think this stuff is important. Um, I'm, I won't talk as much about theory here, but at least about kind of why I got involved in this, this sort of work. Um, I, I was born and raised in a, a small mining town in the northeastern part of Pennsylvania, uh, a couple hours north of Philadelphia, a couple hours west of, of New York City. Um, really was made up of people, and I, I came from people that left Europe and other places, um, really kind of seeking survival and a better life. Um, awful lot of them came from Ireland, uh, from Galway and Mayo and Sligo particularly, some from Donegal. Um, very, you know, great places. And, and by the way, I, I won't tell you where my mother's from. And I won't do all that kind of stuff that all the rest of the Yanks do when they come here. Um, <laughs> just the fact of the matter was that we, there's, there's, there was, these were tremendous places where you had this massive and diverse cultures. Um, places that I think were, were, were just amazing. Uh, they were blessed with tremendous natural resources, whether they be you know, things like coal or trees or scenic places, um, really diverse cultures, food that was out of this world, and very special places to me. And uh, there were also places that had incredibly unique cultures. All these different cultures that brought together hundreds of years of knowledge about how to deal with all the daily problems we have, from you know, how to take care of the young and the old, to deal with behaviors, to do all sorts of things. Um, and there were places that were also, they were once really rich in social supports. Uh, whether it be in religious areas or families or neighborhoods, um, you know, there was a lot of, of sense of people looking after you. So these, these were, for me, they were really great places. Um, and to me, they, they kind of held a bit of magic, truth be told. They were, they were, they were home. Um, but for those of you that, that know Lou Reed, the musician, he's always one of my favorites, um, he's got this great lyric in one of his songs that said there's, there's a, a bit of magic in everything and then some loss to even it out. Um, kind of a yin and yang thing, I guess, but... I think Lou put it together better. Um, but really, if you look at these places, the lost was, was, was in a lot of different ways. It was characterized by the communities being exploited by outside interests. Uh, people making decisions on our well-being from boardrooms in New York and London. Uh, people that really had no interest whatsoever in our well-being, our safety, anything else, uh, that took the places for all it was worth. Um, so there was, there was kind of a breakdown of community there. Um, it was also a place that, as times went on, um, you know, young people were forced to leave. Much as we've seen here, as we've seen all over the world, uh, the young people are forced out of their, their hometowns. Um, really kind of denied their, their rightful heritage and their ability to, to be involved in protecting these places that we think are really particularly dear to us. Um, and like you, so many places worldwide, they really became nomads or you know, the diaspora. They, they kind of spread all over the world and had very few chances of coming back. Um, I know it all sounds kind of bleak, but I'll get to it. I'll get to a happier point, I promise. Um, these were also places where, you know, as all these kind of pieces came together, we saw declines in education, and we saw dramatic declines in civic engagement across the board from young people to old people, but particularly young people, that saw absolutely no role for them whatsoever uh, in the changing societies. And really, it was an environment where it led to just complete inaction. And this inaction, you know, part of it was forced by the idea that economic decline was the natural form of things, that everything was controlled by money and people with power. Um, and people gave up the choice of acting. They chose up, gave up the choice of being actively involved in their, communi in their communities. Um, and, and whether this was you know, decided by you know, trade unions or governments or affluent founding families that convinced people they were looking out for them when they weren't or whatever else, um, people got completely disengaged. And that led to sort of the decline of a lot of these places. Um, now, in truth, you know, this, this whole impotence of people not being involved and young people abandoning a lot of hope and everything else, you know, wasn't the result of the, you know, the Illuminati or the Freemasons or, you know, whatever version of the man you want to point to, which we always had some conspiracy theory going about why things were so bad. 
Uh, for me, it was something much simpler and, and something much more ominous that I, I would see it as. And, and it was, it's kind of harder and painful to admit, actually, when you think about it. Um, but really, it was a systematic breakdown of our communities. Very quickly, over the last you know, 50 to 100 years, uh, we've seen dramatic breakdowns in how we deal with each other, how we live our lives, all kinds of things that we do. Um, and for people who are able to remain in their communities, um, they still remain very disconnected and, and kind of lost souls in lots of ways. So, like I said, it's, it's, it's a rather bleak and depressing situation, but there is lots of hope that I'll get to. Um, and there are some changes we're seeing. So, I want you to kind of think about it in this way. And, and other people have talked about whether this really signals the, the whole demise of community. And I think it's an important question to answer. Um, there's a few great books out there, uh, if you're ever interested in this. And I'll just touch on it quick, because it's a lot of people in our, in our policy settings, a lot of people in our government settings, especially when it comes to focusing on youth, kind of kick around the idea that, you know, the world is a much bigger global place now, and the local places don't matter. And there's other people that say local places are probably the most important aspect of this. If we want to facilitate any kind of change, if we want to protect people, it's the local level is where it has to start. Um, there's two great books there, and you can look them up if you ever like, but uh, The Great Change and the Eclipse of Community. They came out in the 60s and 70s. Um, and the basic idea was that the modern life we have, the lives we live, um, it's made community completely irrelevant. And if you actually think about it kind of critically, there's, there's probably some valid points to it. I mean, we're an incredibly global society now. I mean, it's just, you know, today's a normal Friday. And, you know, a day and a half ago, I was in America. Here I am giving a talk in Ireland. This morning, I had a Skype, a Skype conversation with somebody from Japan. You know, my networks of people are all over the world. We're a global society, and it's not at all uncommon. Um, so a lot of people think that, you know, that's, that's our world now, that whether I live on my street or my neighborhood or wherever else, it doesn't matter. Um, I think it does. But there's a few things that I'd like to point out, and I think a lot of these, they really stress, there's certain things we might want to think about as we're dealing with young people, as we're planning programs and other things. Uh, because increasingly we're seeing that the young people feel completely disconnected from, from their hometowns, from their places. Um, some of the things these folks have pointed out, there's a certain bit of truth to them, but there's also a certain, maybe things are just different. Um, one of the things is our, our communities tend to be tied much more directly to things outside the community. And just, you know, for those of you, you think about your hometowns. How many, how many of your banks or newspapers or local papers and banks, you know, where you do your shopping and everything else? How many of them are local mom and pop places? Um, think about that. Increasingly, we're seeing more and more you know, companies and stores from way outside the community that make decisions on our, our behalf that don't know us, don't care about us, don't do anything else. Um, we've got increasingly routine lives. Over the last 20 or 30 years, we're seeing that we really, really like our routines. And if we get out of our routine, we get really messed up. So we've got to kind of break that. Um, one of the key things I'm going to talk about is that the cornerstone of any kind of community building, I see this as, as an inter interactive process. And the more we interact with each other, the better off we are. There's a trend, it's, it's really, and we're seeing it worldwide. We tend to interact more and more with people just like us, the people we work with, the people with the same educational background, same, you know, all kinds of whatever interests. Um, that's fine, but it doesn't bring in new ideas. It doesn't bring exposure to anything else. Um, other things here, too. This, this idea of increasingly automated and impersonal connections. When I think of the last time you called a telephone number for customer service, you probably talked to a computer a lot, lower, a lot, lot more than you talked to a person, didn't you? Yeah, it happens that way. Um, this impersonal contact, it also leads to some really weird things, uh, particularly young people. My, I had this very uncomfortable conversation with my nephew this spring about why it was inappropriate to break up with his girlfriend via text. Um, <laughs> yes. I, I, Ladies, you'll be happy he got the beating he deserved. Um, that probably wasn't a good thing to say to a room full of youth workers. Uh, but, uh, but, but nonetheless, he won't do it again. Um, but we see these kind of things a lot. Um, and it's also the case that we have less frequent and less substantive contact with people. There's never been a point in human existence where we've had a better chance of talking to people and dealing with people. From these silly little phone devices we have, to Skype, to email, to fax, to phones, to everything else. There's absolutely no shortage. Uh, but a lot of people are arguing we have very, very superficial contact. We don't get to the, the real meat of things that actually changes our ideas and shapes our, our beliefs. 
Um, so we've got these kind of things. And then the last one here is you know, the whole idea of transferring a lot of the functions that used to exist within our communities and our neighborhoods to outside interests, to you know, for-profit industries or whatever. Uh, think about the way we used to take care of the old and the young. It was primarily in the household. Um, now we kind of you know, ship that out to other places. Now, in terms of young people, all of these things were incredibly important, all, especially this last one, the way we took care of each other. That taught young people from the very beginning an awful lot about resiliency, about life, about the importance of taking care of people and appreciating people while they were around, um, how to deal with loss, how to be resilient in the face of all sorts of other things, uh, how to create empathy. So as we lose these functions, a lot of the things that impact young people, we've got to be really careful that we don't lose these. Um, as things change, they just change in different ways. Now, um, like I said, so much for the inspirational speech you were promised. promised. Um, but it's not so bad. And if it is that bad, we know how to change it. And that's, that's the really exciting thing. Uh, we actually have tons of research, lots of research, theory, and programs. We've got evidence from all kinds of programs all over the world uh, that communities can be brought back to life. And more importantly, that young people are going to be the absolute central players in that process. Uh, we've got lots of research showing that young people are absolutely craving to be involved in this. Um, not in ways like they were in the past, but to be actual leaders in the process, um, which I think is a really cool thing. And like I said, tremendous evidence from all over the place. And this isn't just from academics. This is from you know, do-gooding idealistic activists, uh, you know, battle-hardened people who are out in practice, uh, governments, people in the field, uh, even from shrewd business people to NGOs and religions. We're seeing tremendous change take place. We're seeing communities being empowered and put back on their feet. Um, and like I said, one of the key players in this thing has been young people. So it's, it's a great thing there. And as we see communities being empowered, I, I, I want to think again about the importance of, of our, our local level. The, uh, the American statesman, Tip O'Neill, you may have heard of him, had this great quote that all politics is local. He kind of lived by this whole quote of his. Uh, well, for me, any kind of social change or request for social justice is local. Every great social movement we've ever had, any great revolution we've ever had, they all came at the local level. They didn't magically appear at some government level and decided for it to happen. It's been local people on the ground picking a fight. And that's, that's what we need to kind of go after again. And what we're doing, we're building capacity and empowering communities at the local level. And a really cool thing, like I can't say enough, is that the best agents of change we're having are young people. They're really stepping up in lots of ways. So I thought what I would do quick is, is just give you a bit of, of some context about what I think community is. Uh, and then I can tell you some of the findings we've had from different things uh, and then give a list of, of a lot of the different ideas that can be put into practice. Um, so we'll take it from there quick. Um, think about this in terms of, of what's community. This is, this is one of these magic terms that's amazing. I love it every time we have a, a presidential election in the U.S. Um, I make my students listen to all the presidential debates and count how many times they say the word community. It's an amazing thing. And actually, you know, you've got an hour-long debate and it's on primetime television. You know, you can put an actual cost amount to every single word that's chosen. Usually in those hour-long debates, it's not uncommon to hear the, the word community said dozens of times. It brings up all these nice warm and, feely, warm and fuzzy feelings, uh, all the ideas of what we think society was or could be or should be or all kinds of other things. Um, that's a great thing, but it's also the case that we often don't know what it is. We often don't talk about what it is and we just assume it floats out there somewhere. And, um, and if that's the case, it's real hard for us to plan and make programs and, and other things around it. Um, there's tremendous things going on with this and this idea of community isn't some kind of abstract, touchy-feely thing. We've got lots of ways to measure it, to quantify it for those of you that that need that information for funders or government programs, we can actually measure the outputs uh, and the impacts of what's happening at the community level. So let me just give you a look, quick, quick rundown here. Um, there's lots of ways communities to find. Uh, for me, the one that makes the most sense is this kind of interactive approach. Or you hear it called an um, interactional approach or some other things. But the general idea here, and I think it's a really unique perspective, and it's actually measurable, and it's things we can actually put in practice in the field. Um, you think about our communities. At the core of it, it's the interaction and it's the interdependence among people. It's the people you hold dear within your place that you, you work with, you, you deal with at all kinds of levels. Um, and if you think about any of our towns, any of our places, we've got all these pockets of people. 
They may be broken up by religion. They may be broken up by the types of jobs they do. Uh, they might be broken up by whatever else. Um, but they're all special interest groups. Everybody's you know, got pockets of people. Think about, think around Galway. Um, community happens as these groups start talking together, as they start interacting together. Now, the last thing I want to suggest is that these groups give up who they are, that they give up their identity, and that they all become of one mind and idea and everything else. Um, the fact of the matter is we can be very different from each other, but still reach agreements on the common things we need. So let me just show you. I put together... I got carried away with my PowerPoints. Um, if you think about, think about Galway, for example, or, or any places you can think of, I mean, we've got all these different types of groups. You've got young people and old people. You've got the university community. You've got the business group. Um, you've got residents that have been here forever, and you've got you know, the blow-ins who've been here for, you know. I always love, Carmel tells me a story about her family has been, how long have they been there? They came in the Generations. The yeah, they've been there forever, but they're still considered blow-ins because they've not been there for 85 generations. Um, we've got all these people, and we have a hard time talking with each other a lot of times. All these groups take care of their own. Now, the thing that I think is really cool, as they start talking, as they communicate, as they interact, as they do whatever else, um, it's a central area here that's important. It's an overlapping area. And what that means, and, and how we put this into practice, is that all these groups don't necessarily have to like each other. But we can realize that we need better roads, that our schools are bad, that our kids, regardless of what setting they're in, are getting in trouble, and we've got to fix this. And we can work together to make those kind of changes happen. And we can make young people be central players in it. It's that central area there that it's a common general interest. And that really kind of focuses a lot of what we do. Um, so as these groups, as they kind of get together, you often hear the term community agency or community capacity or all sorts of other things. But if we can facilitate this level of development, just absolutely great things happen. Um, once again, think about this as a, as, as a relationship. Think about the way that this works out. Um, it's a lot harder for these groups to disagree with each other and dislike each other and fight and everything else if you're talking to them, if you're communicating. And there's lots of ways we can facilitate that. And this really pulls together. Now, as we get on to the, the, the good stuff, I just want to stress a few things. And, and that was an incredibly short and quick crash course and probably even too much um, of the whole kind of community process. Um, I can talk more about that at other times, and I can certainly get you articles and fact sheets and other things. Um, but I want to stress this idea that this process is essential of getting people talking together. It may sound very simple, but it does wonderful things because we don't talk too much at all. The key thing I want to mention here is the idea that this community is not a given. I mean, if I was to go around the room here and say, tell me about your community, almost 100% of you would say, you know, it's Galway, it's Tomb, it's, it's wherever. You'd give me a geographical place. Some place you could point to on a map and it has boundaries and everything else. That's certainly important, but the fact of the matter is that doesn't tell you anything about the people there. We've got, think about after the boom here, uh, all the development of localities we had, all the housing estates that went up. Uh, we've had the same thing after World War II in America, that we had a tremendous growth in localities, but I wouldn't for a second consider them communities. And uh, I have this great friend of mine. He's actually, I think, the third person I ever met. Um, there was my mother, who I think was the first one. Um, and then the doctor that delivered me. And then they shoved me in the nursery next to this other guy. And I've been stuck with him for 40-some years now. And uh, we're great friends. But one of the things he has is uh, he, he lives kind of midway between New York City and Philadelphia. And uh, um, truth be told, he likes to put on airs a little bit. And uh, he's got this big fancy trophy home, you know, that he put up and sends me pictures of to say how great it is. Um, but I said to him, you know, how do you like it? And he said, well, you know, I'm not there that much. And so how's that? Well, he works in New York City, so every morning he gets up at about 4 o'clock, gets on a bus, and goes into the city, has his breakfast there, works all day with his friends and colleagues there, um, probably has a, a snack on the way home, gets on the bus, returns home about 8 o'clock at night, um, maybe pats the kids on the head, has a has a sandwich, and goes to bed and does it again, um, as do all of his neighbors. He wouldn't know his neighbors if he ran over them. Um, there, there's no connection whatsoever. So we've seen this kind of thing. So community isn't a given. Just because you can point to a place on a map, it's not a given. It's the relationships between people. Uh, and if we avoid this process, it's, it's where it gets really kind of messy. And the outcome of avoiding this process of the decline of our communities is a complete loss of identity and all sorts of other things for young people, 
um, for older people, it's a loss of jobs, it's a loss of, of potentials and services. Um, you know, Pat and, and many other people here have done tons of work on social supports. As we become less and less connected, those things disappear really quickly, and we know they're, they're absolutely essential. Um, so I want you to keep in mind here this idea that, that, that really community, it's a variable. And think about any of your towns, any of the places you're from, any city, village, anywhere else. They're constantly changing. You're always getting a new influx of people. People are getting older, people are getting, you know, younger people are appearing. You've got all this stuff. No communities are the same two days in a row. Community is a process and that we have to be working and making sure all these different groups of people that they're involved. It can be tricky and it can be messy, but the key thing there is that helps build capacity. Uh, if we don't work a community and building it, it's just going to disappear. And that's really the way it is. Um, maybe in the past it was a lot easier for us because we were, you know, geographically we were stuck somewhere and by nature of it we had to interact with each other constantly and that helped build community. Uh, things are different now. There was a, there's this great statistic that up until I think the 19, early 1960s, um, most people on the planet could expect to die within five miles of where they were born. And most of your services, most of everything you did was, was in your immediate area. Um, that's not the case anymore. Think how far you travel, you travel for, for health care, for shopping, to buy a car, to do whatever else. Um, the boundaries of our lives are, are much broader. Uh, and with that, we lose a lot of the connections there that kind of formed who we are. It's particularly damaging for the young people. And that's, that's something I want to keep in mind here. So let's get to some of the stuff here that's, that can be actually useful and, and can fit into practice and other stuff. Um, what do we know from all the research and, and experience and practice? Um, as I said before, we've got absolute mountains of, of information on this, absolute mountains of it. Uh, we've got program evaluations like you wouldn't believe. We've got hundreds of books, thousands of journal articles. We've got evidence from the field that you, that you wouldn't believe. Uh, and even better, we've studied this whole process about how community can be built and young people can be involved and, and integrated into it. Uh, we've looked at it all over the world, and the process is the same. The context and and the, the lives of people are slightly different, and we can adjust for that. But the process that leads to community, that leads to young people being supported and pulled in, it's the same everywhere. It works everywhere. And the one thing we found that, that holds true is that if you've got a place you know, where people care about each other and the place where they live, absolutely tremendous things happen. And this isn't just an idea. This isn't a plan. It's fact. This is a fact that we have. And strong communities, they equal strong, resilience, civil societies all the things that we're striving for. So some of the things that we've, we've come up with, and I just wanted to mention just in passing uh, a few studies we've done, and I won't get into all the, the academic silliness of how we did it and everything else, but I can send you the papers if you ever want them. Um, fact of the matter is we, we, we did them really well in terms of, of everything. You can trust me on that. They're, they're legendary in their quality. Um, one of them here was a study we did a few years ago uh, that looked at communities in Ireland and Pennsylvania. Uh, looked at a, did a bunch of case studies of communities in, in Mayo, in Offaly, in Westmeath, uh, in Donegal, uh, also some similar communities in Pennsylvania. And really we wanted to figure out what got people active in their communities. Young people, old people, people of all different ages. Um, the three big things that jumped out, this is where I come back to this idea of interaction. Uh, the more people interacted, the more likely they were to get involved. And this may seem kind of like common sense, but if you think about our world and the way we live, um, we don't interact as much. And what this whole idea of interacting does is, you know, if I don't talk to my neighbors, I don't realize that someone down the street you know, needs health care, or that they're old and in need of something else, or they need their children watched, or they need help doing something else. So the more we interact with people, the more we're, we're made aware of opportunities for action, for us to take a, a stand on something. Uh, we're also made aware of the conditions that are out there that we just don't know about. We're very busy in our lives, and it's hard to, to keep track of all these things. Um, we also found that the ties people had to the place and also the, the level of attachment all shaped it. These were tremendously powerful things. So that was, that's one study. Um, there's another fantastic study that's just come out recently. Uh, Baroiga and the, and the best practice unit here, um, and this was, this was led by, by Dr. Sue Redman, there she is up there, yeah, um, did absolutely a remarkable study and uh, looked at the leadership, youth leadership program that Freud has developed, and Sue just went, went crazy evaluating it, um, gathering data continuously to see what people were doing and how it was impacting them and what was going on with it. Um, they found a bunch of things. 
And we found certain stuff that, you know, people that benefited most from, from it were ones who had already had some resilience, already had some good self-belief and empathy and well-being um, and good social supports. Uh, all those led to them being really effective and, and functioning people. Now, part of that, too, speaks to we don't want to just always go get the usual cast of characters, all the best kids who join all the clubs and have most of the supports. Uh, the flip side of this is, is we want to look for the people who are maybe lacking in resiliency, uh, the ones who don't have the social supports and other things. We know that there's a tremendous interest in young people to be involved and want to do all this uh, and to be very active players in their communities, not just kind of token gestures. Um, the really cool thing with this study, it came out with you know, the outputs of it. They had increased empathy, which is, is more and more we're seeing is, is absolutely essential. Uh, their social supports across the board went up like crazy. They got more involved in their communities. And this is another thing that we'll talk about, but if you can get people involved, youth, young people involved in their communities early, it sort of becomes a habit. It's a lifelong thing where they, they, they stay involved in it. Um, and you can see other stuff too. They, they became more resilient than all these other things. Um, but one of the key, key things that jumped out of the project was that there is a big active interest in young people wanting to be serious contributors to their local societies. Not just small or minor things. They want to be right there with everyone else. Um, absolutely an amazing study. And then there's uh, just one other one I'll mention, and then we'll talk about a few other things. Um, uh, Pat and I and some other people have been doing studies all over the place um, the last couple of years, uh, looking at what got young people involved in their communities in terms of civic engagement. Um, and we looked at Ireland and Pennsylvania and Florida. Um, they've all got the same climate, so we figured that was good, you know, right? Um, come and visit Pennsylvania. You'll be surprised how little, you know, warmth there is. Um, but the big predictors here of what got people involved, the extent to which they interacted with their friends outside of school. Um, a lot of places, it's, 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 you're seeing it more in Ireland and we certainly have been trying to push it in the States, uh, is the idea that volunteerism has become like a mandatory part of, of school. Um, the idea is it gets people involved and active. The practice is that they do the minimum amount they have to because it's work. Um, people they interact with outside of school bring a whole different dimension. It helped them kind of understand why being involved is important, how it contributes, what it does. Uh, we also found that the more social supports people had from friends and parents and other people uh, were absolutely essential to getting them involved and keeping them involved. And uh, we also looked at one of the things that jumped out here was, was the quality of life of their neighborhoods. And this is another thing I want to stress because this is, I think, really important to practice. Very often we get the usual cast of characters, you know, the overachiever, young kids who are involved in every club and they're just, you know, have all the gold stars and ribbons and everything they get. Um, I personally like looking out for the hooligans. They're, they're my favorite bunch. I like the ones who were, you know, nobody would ever pick to be a leader. Because um, actually a lot of our historical record shows that they're the ones who rise to the occasion. Um, so as we look at people, people who are in neighborhoods who have a very low quality of life, um, we want to think about engaging those kids. Not, not that we don't have to take all the ones who are always overachieving. Uh, but the ones who, who very often are overlooked because of the environment they're in, um, those are they're absolutely key players, and they often bring a dimension that's, that's incredibly new and unique. So let me get to some of the other things here, some of the, the meat of what we got. Um, what can we do here to, to use this in practice? How can we put this into programs and policies? Now, th this is by no means a, a complete list, but it's a certain number of things that I think are really useful and, and some good places to begin. Um, this goes for young people and it goes for people of all ages as well. Um, be more active. We're incredibly busy. I know how busy we are with, with all of our time commitments and everything else. Um, but there's a general trend across the world that we're, you know, we're more tied up in rushing home to watch TV and do other things. Um, if you can't volunteer, visit neighbors, join groups. Just be out there and be active. There's no thing, no act that's too small. Um, the other thing, get young people involved from a very early age. It becomes almost a standard part of life or an addiction. Um, they just, they'll do it for a long time and we see this. And it tends to be a lifelong process. Interact. And I know this may sound like a silly thing. Of course we all interact. But really, we tend to act with people like us. Um, the other thing is we don't interact nearly as much as we used to. And I'm probably the first one to admit it. You know, I'm saying, you know, do as I say, not as I do. Um, you know, I come home at the end of the day and I'm exhausted and 
I fly into the garage like Batman and I close the door behind it and God forbid I talk to my neighbors. Um, we have to make an active effort of doing this kind of stuff. Um, and, I, and I do do that kind of thing. So the more you interact, the more it's, it's a better thing. Same for young people. Get them there exposed to people, um, especially people not like us. It's great to have friends and colleagues and everybody else that are, that are very similar in interests and everything else. But one of the things that, as you have new populations moving into your communities, they bring a whole body of knowledge. It's a way to make them more integrated into local society. Uh, we learn from them, they learn from us. Uh, it makes a transparent kind of thing where there's, there's not the obstacles that we would have. Um, similarly there, make room for those not like us on different activities. And this goes for old people and young people, but invite them in, especially young people. This opens up tremendous doors of, of doing different things. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, Pat, Pat especially has done all kinds of work on social supports of all different types. Um, more and more we're seeing that this is absolutely essential. And there's, there's a lot of different types, but I think we should be real diverse in the types of supports we provide and the ones we make sure we, we get in there. Um, we see tremendous things from getting support from parents and friends uh, and siblings. But also keep in mind, think back to when, when we were younger. Uh, there's certain things you can't talk to your parents and friends about. Uh, we're seeing that other outside adults uh, can often be absolutely instrumental in getting people on the right path, uh, especially when they're dealing with all kinds of challenges. Um, the other thing here that's, that's important, be active in local decision making. We've often thrown up our hands and say, oh, the system's too corrupt and complicated and everything else. Um, there's no shortage of ways for us to be involved. You can vote, email, write letters, attend meetings, go to protests, get young people involved in this from the beginning. It's a key thing there. Um, the other thing we're seeing more and more is the whole focus of empathy. And the more empathy people have, the more they tend to be engaged in the community and tend to be more kind of well-rounded individuals. Um, fostering this idea of empathy for young people is absolutely key. And doing it by leading by example is, is the big part. Um, show them why they should care about everybody else. Show them why they should take action on behalf of, of different parts of the the place and other people that are there. And then I got a couple last ones here, and then, we'll, then maybe we can talk a little bit. Um, these are very practical ones. If you want people to be involved in your communities, especially young people, invite them. The biggest predictor we see of people getting involved is if someone goes and asks them to be part of it. And this actually kind of makes sense when you think about it. Think about when you were younger, think about even now. You may have an interest in doing something that changes society and does and contributes to things that are going on. Uh, but you don't quite know where to begin. We know for a fact, and we've got tons of research to support this, if somebody asks you, it's about 90% that you're going to get involved. If somebody in a position of authority asks you, it kind of boosts your ego and it's almost about 100% that you get involved. Um, that can often be the seeds for getting people doing all sorts of stuff. Um, a lot of us like to think of ourselves as role models, and we focus on the importance of mentoring and everything else. Serve as a mentor and a, and a role model. Uh, Lots of the research out there shows that young people who are exposed to somebody in their household or somebody they know that volunteers, uh, they're almost, in a lot of cases, more than twice as likely to get involved in long-term volunteerism and community engagement. Um, we often don't think of the impacts we have on people just by our behaviors. And a lot of times, people, young people imitate those. Um, other, here, other things here, make room for young people to share their experiences. Some kind of, and I'm not even quite sure how, how or why, but some kind of magic happens. Uh, young people start talking about what they've done, and it excites other people. It kind of gives them the sense that they've done something important. And really what we're seeing from the research is that if young people actually share their experiences with others, we see more people involved, but also themselves, uh, they're, they're exceedingly more likely to continue being vol volunteers and activists. Um, the last thing here that I'll just touch on, um, this kind of seems strange with all the other stuff here. But one of the key things we see that, that shapes people's willingness to act and gives young people a really sense of belonging and identity uh, is the attachment to the place they're in. And think about all the places where you grew up and how important it was to your, your development. Uh, support things that are local, your local markets and shops, and sports and entertainment, all these kind of things. Not only are those places venues for interaction to get people involved, it really fosters a sense of attachment amongst young people. Um, I mean, think about it. You've got, you know, all the famous places around town here, for example, that you, you may have loved to go for a, a bite to eat or a drink or whatever else, or where the best matches took place, or all these kind of things. That level of attachment that's, that's fostered there, uh, it pulls people in and makes them much more likely to act on behalf of their communities. 
So that's kind of a short list of, of, of some of the things we found and some of them maybe the frameworks for there. You know, um, but really, I, I'd love to talk more about it. I know I think we've got a, a bit of extra time. Do we? A few minutes. A few minutes? Have I gone too long? No. No? Okay. Um, I tried to time it last night. But, um, so questions, comments, anything?